In 1959, while exploring Swildon's Hole, John Wallington was hypothermic and ascending a rope ladder when he slipped. As he fell, his foot caught in a rung, leaving him dangling upside down with an ice-cold waterfall flowing over him. The force of the water flowing over his body made it impossible to raise up and free his entangled foot. If he wasn't freed in a matter of minutes, he would die from exposure. This is the Swildon Hole disaster. On January 17, 1959, a group of experienced and inexperienced cavers and divers assembled at Maine's barn near the entrance to Swildon's Hole in the small town of pretty Somerset, England. Their objective was to extend the mapped area of Swildon's Hole. Specifically, they were there to map Sump 5 and beyond if possible. The cavers were divided up into several groups including divers and porters, also commonly called Sherpas. The porters would carry 35 loads of equipment down to the Blue Pencil Passage or the BP Passage. From there, the divers would transport the gear from the BP Passage to Swildon's 4, where they would set up camp, and the divers would use that camp as home base to dive Number 5 Sump and beyond. While the group assembled and reviewed the cave layout and their instructions, a man approached and introduced himself as John Wallington. He was there to explore the cave for himself and asked if he could join one of the groups of porters and help take down some of the equipment. It was not his first cave, but he was not an experienced cave diver like some, so it was agreed that he could tag along with a porter group. This was a great opportunity for John as he could explore the cave and would most certainly gain a great deal of knowledge from the years of experience around him. It should also be noted that John was simply wearing a cotton shirt and jeans. He was not wearing an exposure suit or wetsuit like the divers and some of the other cavers. However, he was not the only one. Many porters were dressed as he was. That morning, on January 17, 1959, the cavers entered one by one through the small entry that led from the outside stream to the main stream just inside the entrance. The six groups included more than 35 cavers, each having their own job to do in the cave. After heading into the cave and traversing the keyhole, the cavers were met with their first real obstacle, the 40. This was a 40-foot drop nearly straight down. However, because the 40 was almost always wet, providing slick rocks and was extremely dangerous, it had been equipped with a rope ladder to assist the cavers. The rope ladder provided much-needed assistance over the slick, wet rocks as the small stream flowing into the cave also flowed down these rocks and over the cavers as they descended the 40. Every caver after descending the 40 was completely soaked as they descended all 40 feet with a waterfall flowing straight on top of them. Included in the group of 35 to 40 cavers was a group of divers that were to map the end of the cave. These divers descended deeper and deeper into the cave through Sump 4 to the area known as Swildon 6. As they descended the cave, reaching and traversing each sump, they noticed that the water level was slowly rising. This was expected, as earlier in the week a snowstorm had come through, and the ground on the surface was covered with snow and ice that was melting as the day grew later. This presented a constant flow of extremely cold water throughout the descent. The divers of Group 1 were further separated into subgroups, the first including four divers, Bevan, Buxton, Wells, and Phil Davies, and the second group including three divers, Ford, Wright, and Lloyd Davies. Their job was a huge undertaking. The divers were to collect the 35 loads of gear that was brought down by the porters and then transported from the BP Passage to Swildon's Four. At Swildon's Four, they would set up camp. The four divers were to head into Sump Five and on to the Swildon Six, while the three divers were to stay behind and provide support to the other four. The porters were separated into six groups, with John being part of Group Five. Each party of the porters entered the cave at 15-minute intervals, each reaching the 40 and descending the ladder with increasing water flowing over them. They were instructed to use a lifeline while descending, as a fall could be extremely dangerous and possibly deadly. The conditions in the cave were still quite good, even though the cold water was slowing down the cavers in descending the 40. The slow progress caused the porters to pile up. Party 4 ran into Party 3, still descending, then Party 5. This was approximately 1.30 p.m., and all was still good. They continued on, pushing to the Blue Pencil Passage. By 3 o'clock that afternoon, all divers had reached Sump 4 and were ready to begin setting up. The packs were pushed through the BP passage to the divers. The divers took the packs 80 feet upstream to the camp and began preparing for their dive. The last party carrying packs arrived at approximately 5.15 at the BP passage, where the water level had increased significantly. However, the mainstream had not risen. 
The flow was much stronger and was discolored. Though the water level was not yet rising, they knew it would be soon. They needed to stow away their equipment and suspend diving operations. At about 5.30 p.m., the divers packed up their equipment, suspended dive operations, and began heading to the surface. Earlier, at 3.30 p.m., as the dive groups were transporting the packs from the BP passage to the divers, outside on the surface, it began to rain. This rain was a sudden downpour and it didn't stop. The surface had no communication with the divers down below, but they knew the porters were on their way back and would be exiting soon. They also knew that the experienced divers at the number four would recognize the changing conditions and head to the surface. At this point, there was no reason to be alarmed as they thought everyone should be getting out safely. However, they did put in a call to the Mendip Rescue Organization to put a rescue team on standby on the surface, the rain melted the snow and ice, and a freezing cold slurry ran into the entrance of the cave. A group of seven divers were still on the surface, and three of them entered the cave, as they knew cavers would be trying to exit, and they were going to need help to get up the 40, with this ice-cold water flowing over the top of them. At the 40, the flowing water had turned into a torrent. The cave narrows at this point, causing all of the water to be concentrated flowing over the edge, resulting in an extremely powerful waterfall. In order to exit the cave, people below had to climb the ladder against this waterfall. After seeing this torrent, the three divers at the top of the 40 believed that it would be impossible to ascend the ladder because of the amount of water flowing over the edge. They believed that the only option for the cavers below was to wait it out and try to keep warm. After all, eventually the rain would stop and the cavers would be able to exit, but no one knew when that would be. The water raging over the edge and crashing at the bottom echoed throughout, making it impossible to communicate with anyone below. So there was no audible or visual communication between the rescuers at the top and the cavers trapped 40 feet below. From 3.30 to 4.30, the rescuers waited at the top of the 40, looking for cavers to ascend the ladder, but none came. They knew at this point that it would be at least six hours before the water flow would reduce enough for the cavers to be able to ascend the ladder. They would be no good to the cavers below if they were too cold and exhausted when it was time to get them out. So, they went back to town to eat and warm up, waiting for the flow to subside so they could get to the trapped cavers when it was possible. As they left to rest and re-energize, base camp called Mendip Rescue Organization to make sure that the rescue team was on standby and to prepare special hauling equipment to hoist up people from the 40 if needed. Shortly after this group of divers left, several cavers exited the tiny entry, powering through the torrent of water flowing into the cave. Then, at 6.05, another group exited the cave and told base camp that there was a group forming below the 40 lining up to climb out. Two cavers, O.C. Lloyd and M. Dell, headed into the cave. As they were heading in, they ran into a caver coming out. The caver told them that several people at the bottom needed treatment and one was suffering from extreme exposure. The message was relayed to base camp where they were told to get the hauling gear from Mendip Rescue Organization as soon as possible. When they reached the top of the 40, six people were there helping up a man with a sprained wrist. Five of the cavers assisted the injured man out while Lloyd took over on the lifeline, helping up the next group of freezing porters. Below were several porters that were not wearing exposure suits, including John Wallington. The people that were cold and not wearing exposure suits were being brought up first. Lloyd manned the lifeline while five of these porters were brought up. The sixth man tied into the lifeline, but was too weak and cold to climb the ladder. They removed the line, and at approximately 7.30 p.m., John tied in. With his body shaking uncontrollably and barely able to move his hands, he grasped the rungs of the ladder. The cavers below told him, keep climbing. Do not stop, just climb until you're at the top. John lifted himself onto the ladder and started climbing. He made it about halfway and stopped. He couldn't go any further, but he couldn't communicate this above or below. He took a step back and slipped. The line pulled tight after looping around a pipe at the top of the 40. He was now hanging upside down as his leg was caught behind one of the rungs in the ladder. As he was hanging upside down, the freezing cold water poured over him, entering his nose and mouth. Another caver named F. Darbin rushed to his aid, climbing up the ladder from below. Darbin pushed upward on John's shoulders, trying to lift him upright so they could release Wallington's foot from behind the ladder rung, but it was no use. The force from the water added to John's weight was too much. Darbin couldn't lift him. After seeing that Darbin could not lift John on his own, 
Another caver in Humphreys, waiting at the base of the 40, climbed the ladder and helped push again. It was no use. It had now been several minutes and they knew that John would soon die of hypothermia if they did not get him out of the waterfall. Darbin decided to take a different approach. They couldn't lift John from below, so Darbin ascended the ladder over John and got above him. There, Darbin was blocking some of the waterfall with his own body, relieving some of the force exerted on John's body. With this, Darbin was able to remove John's foot from the ladder, causing John to fall into the arms of Humphreys. They pulled John to the side and sat him on a ledge. Now, John was soaked in the cold cave and hypothermic. He wouldn't last much longer, but the hauling equipment had not yet arrived to hoist him out, and they had no other way of getting him over the 40. To make matters worse, other cavers at the bottom were not wearing exposure suits and were also becoming hypothermic. As John waited for the hauling equipment, the other cavers climbed the ladder and were taken out of the cave. Several people comforted John and tried to keep his body temperature up. They gave him chocolate and glucose tablets, which he was able to ingest. Between 8 and 8.30, the hauling gear arrived. Many of the other cavers in need had been extracted at this point, and John was the only one left that was in immediate need of aid. They hooked John up in the bosun's chair and began hauling him up, as another caver followed him up, making sure everything was okay. About halfway up, John's foot caught on a rung of the ladder, and Hawks tried to free it, but there was still no way of communicating with the rescue team above. So the rescue team continued to hoist up John, but now they were not just hoisting up John, but John, Hawks, and the ladder. When John arrived at the top, as quickly as they could, they moved John to the keyhole where they had two options, through the sump or up through the keyhole. The easiest option was to take him through the sump. But as soon as John touched the water, the trauma set in and he started to scream and fight against them. They knew that this was not going to be possible. They were going to have to raise him through the keyhole. As they began positioning him to raise him through the keyhole, John let out a deep breath and died in Mike Palmer's arms. It was 9 o'clock that night when the message was relayed to base camp that John was gone. They sent a body bag to the rescue team. They placed John's body in the bag and he was taken out through the sump. This tragedy led to the development and use of the heated breather. Now, rescue teams in cold, wet conditions carry heated air that can be used to increase the internal temperature of hypothermic cavers. This has and will continue to save stranded cavers' lives. This is True Tragedies. Please like, leave comments, and subscribe. Thanks for watching.